Everybody, could you help me welcome our online audience in this morning? Yeah. Amen. We are so grateful that you're joining us today, wherever you may be in your walk with God, wherever you may be in your life. We just believe that today's viewing by you is not one that has caught God by chance, by accident, but that you are here on purpose watching this message today. I believe God has something for you. And if you're pursuing God, if your your trust and your faith is in God, even if it's just beginning, it's a new walk, a new journey, I believe God will meet you right at the point of your need. And just like all of us in the room today are here to put God first, to make a statement in our lives that God is first above everything else, everything behind that, everything that comes after today is going to have his touch and his hand and his power on it. In Jesus' name. Amen, everybody. Today I want to talk to you this about, about this, keeping your head. Uh, how many of you know it's Super Bowl Sunday? How many of you could care less? Yeah, it's about a split crowd, just what I thought it would be. So I've got to think of some other things other than football to kind of draw you in today. I did not play football. Jason, who spoke however many weeks ago that was, he was a college quarterback. He played football. So whenever he's here and he's not here today, I can have a little liberty. I can act a little bit like I know what's going on, but I have no clue. My son played a, a little bit of football. He was quarterback as well. But Uh, whenever you're in any kind of athletic competition, one of the things you always hear a coach or someone that you're you're following say is they talk about keeping your head in the game, don't they? You stay focused on what's at hand. You know, I've always thought it weird. I've never watched anything the whole week that leads up or two weeks that lead up to the Super Bowl. I could give a rip. You know, what? all the interviews. I mean, some guys are all about it. They could tell you everything everybody has ever said all week long. They could tell you how Patrick Mahomes kind of limped a little bit in what their thoughts are about his high ankle sprain and what it is that Hurts' possibilities are coming up against him. He's got a shoulder. I mean, they know it all. I'm like, wow, you know that more than you know your God. I just thought I'd throw that in there just a little bit. But it's very true that they tell you in sports, because I've had guys tell me, you don't focus on the crowd. You don't focus on the media. You don't focus on anything other than what is next to you, in front of you, in the play that has been called. We're all caught up in all of the hype, the noise, and everything. But those guys, anybody that's in an athletic-type competition has been told to keep your head. Keep your head in the game. And Paul, interestingly enough, in the New Testament, used sports as an analogy. He said that we're to run our race, the race that's been set out before us. And I believe one of the things that we've all got to do is we've got to keep our heads. How many of you understand whenever you lose your head, it can get crazy? None of you have ever done that in traffic, in an argument with somebody, uh, whenever you've been in the middle of a day with your children, you've kind of lost your head a little bit, said things. No one's ever been there? All right. Anybody online, if you've ever been there, you and I have something we're sharing today. But listen, you know, I was just thinking about the introduction of today's message, which introductions torment me. I wish I could just open up and go, hey, open your Bible to this scripture, we just start and we go. But I realize i got to let you settle in for a second. But you know, just this past couple of weeks in our world, if you've been paying attention at all, we got balloons in the sky, jets shooting down balloons in the sky as recent as yesterday. We've got predictions by former military people that we're going to be in a war with, with, with China in a couple of years. We've got TikTok as spyware. It's being infiltrated right now in your very home. China is looking into your home through your child's device, everybody. Have you heard about that? You've got politicians that are keeping top secret documents in all of their multiple residences, which I'm thinking, maybe I went in the wrong business. How could you ever go into one occupation that pays you one salary and become a millionaire? It's amazing, isn't it? So you got the thoughts of all that right there, and can they be trusted? The list could go on and on and on and on about things that are going on in the world around us, from politics, education, just so much stuff. But today's message from me is this. It's a biblical perspective on our culture. And it's a biblical response to the dark and sinister activity of Satan. And I say that word not with any reservation whatsoever at all. There is an adversary that we have, everybody. You've got an adversary to your faith. I got a new book coming. It should be at my house today. It's talking about uh, the 10 most challenging questions about the relevance of God or the Bible in our world. Is it real? I'm going to be digging into that, and I pray for you all in the next few weeks as I start digging into that. You never know what the messages are going to sound like. But, you know, just thinking about whether there truly is a God. 
and whether there truly is an adversary then to the faith that all of us would accept the salvation that we would receive. I believe there is. Now, I don't believe it's as weird as kind of movies have portrayed it. I don't think there's a devil behind any door. I don't think any of that, but there are certainly influences, and we're going to read that and talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But let me start with this verse, John 10, 10. The thief, Satan, the adversary of your faith, he comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. He'll do whatever he can. And mainly his, his, his number one tactic is through deception. Did you hear me, everybody? It's deception. If he can deceive you, he can defeat you. But Jesus said this, and we know this because your words are read in your Bible if you've got a red letter edition. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Well, that's what I'm believing God for. In the midst of balloons in the sky, in the midst of predictions of war, in the midst of spyware on the phone, and in the midst of chaos in, in a culture around everything that is a trigger point for anybody, I'm still believing that this verse is as valid today as the day that Jesus spoke it, somebody heard it, and they recorded it in Scripture. That He has come that we might have life and have it to the full. So I'm going to talk about how that's possible, but first I want to look at a little cultural indicators. I've read these many times in our church, and I'm going to read them again, everybody. Y'all all right with that? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, Paul was talking to this younger guy in ministry. How many of you like it when a mentor or somebody comes along and reassures you that you're not the only one that's experienced some difficult stuff? That's what Paul's doing. He said, hey, mark this. There will be terrible, there will be, there will be terrible times. Everybody, do you see that? There will be no amount of faith, like my son talked about last week. And didn't he do a great job, everybody? Yeah. There will be difficult things that you go through and to use his terminology, the aspect ratio of your faith to the promise of God is not something that determines whether or not God's going to meet your needs. Just, to, just, just, just believe God. If you didn't hear last week's message, you ought to go watch it online or app or any other way that it's all provided out there. But there will be terrible times. It doesn't matter how much we meet, what kind of revival gets poured out, there will be terrible times in the last days. And people will be, y'all catching on what we're looking at here? They will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. No amount of faith you have is going to ever cause your children to be obedient 100% of the time. They're going to be just like you, challenged. But hang on, the message is going to get better. They will be disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, Verse 3 says, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, treacherous, rash, conceited. There will be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. So don't lose your head. God, what's going on in the world? Nothing's right. God, is it, it's not getting better. Don't lose your head. Keep your head. Are you following me? Are you all tracking with me? Now, knowing these things, we don't resign ourselves to the inevitable moral and spiritual decline of the human race. We don't do that. Nor do we retreat and become passive observers of humanity until some predicted outcome or some predicted exit takes place before or after the apocalyptic end of all things as we know them. Are you with me? So we don't retreat. We don't resign ourselves, and we don't go hide somewhere until the predicted end, whether it's pre, mid, post, the apocalypse. We don't do any of that. We keep our head. This is my assignment, everybody, as a pastor. This is my mission. This is the mandate that I have from God, and it's scriptural, just like Paul gave it to Timothy. It says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. When? In the midst of everything we've just, just read. Be prepared in season and out of season. In other words, in all circumstances. Correct, rebuke, and encourage. I'm sorry, I kind of lean more toward the encouragement side up here. But when you encourage, I think you can only encourage by also rebuking and correcting a little bit. Because a true encourager is going to let you know why you're discouraged. And while letting you know why you're discouraged, there will come correction and rebuking. Are you with me? But it can be done in such a way that it encourages you to change what needs to be corrected, and to stop doing what you need to stop doing. Are, are you following me? Huh. It goes on to say, do these things with great patience, and that is not the word that you think. That is not a tolerance. 
These are the dumbest people I've ever seen in my life, Lord. I mean, these people never get it, God. Sheep are so stupid, God. I mean, that's not patience. Patience is endurance. It is constancy. That's what patience is. I hope you knew, I've, I've, I've taught on that numerous times. The word patience is not just tolerating what's going on. Patience actually means consistent constancy. In other words, you don't change. You keep your head in spite of the cultural climate. You keep it all, you keep your wits about you. You keep your faith in position. You stand strong no matter what's going on. So I'm supposed to teach and do all these things with that kind of consistency and careful instruction. Everybody say instruction. That's what I'm going to give you today. Let's look at verse three. It says, for the time will come when men or people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires. Sounds a little bit like selfishness right there, right? They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. How many of you know that all you've got to do is turn your phone on any social media platform and there is somebody telling you how it ought to be? Telling you their truth and telling you their way and telling you something. I mean, there is no loss for instruction in our world today. None whatsoever at all but there is only one truth. Now, your truth can become the truth that is that one truth, can line right up with it, and you can be so helpful, which is what Paul was telling Timothy. Hey, be certain that your instruction, that your careful instruction, line up with the truth because there are going to be people who are just looking for somebody to say what they want to hear. And verse 4 says, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. In other words, people for look for what people will look for what they want to hear rather than what God wants to say to them. Let me say that again, everybody. People will look for what they want to hear rather than what God wants to say to them. That's always happened, always will happen. If you don't believe me, it's it's kind of a parent-child thing that we have with God and we also have with our kids. How many of your kids will have ever said to you about one of your rules or guidelines or the pattern for your family, but so-and-so gets to do it? You ever heard that? But so-and-so gets to, so-and-so gets to, and you probably said exactly what your parents said to to you. I don't care what so-and-so gets to do. So-and-so doesn't live here. You ever said that? Did you say it with a little flair like I just did? I don't care what so-and-so said or what so-and-so's parents say. No one else ever did that? Just me? Well, y'all, I made up for all of you because I said it strong. I don't care what so-and-so get. Does so-and-so get to sleep here at night? Does so-and-so get to swim in that pool outside I take care of? Could I go on, everybody? <laughs> and then I, I know my kids are going to say it to their kids one day. I don't care what so-and-so said, and you just got to hear it on repeat. Well, can you imagine when we're coming to God and we're complaining about things, he's like, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what the world looks like. I don't care what the world thinks. I don't know about you, but I want to hear truth. So there's a verse that caught my attention for today's message, and here it is in verse 5. It's where the title came from. Paul said this to Timothy, in the midst of all this stuff you're going to see, in the midst of your assignment and your mandate, in the midst of whatever culture might look like, you keep your head in all situations. Keep your head. The New Living Translation says, but you should keep a clear mind. But you keep your head. Endure hardship. Well, there it is, everybody. It's like my son talked about last week. Just because you're in faith doesn't mean it won't get difficult. It will. But don't let that be a a, a negative mark against your faith. God's not grading you as someone who's not had enough faith just because something hasn't happened yet. Don't do that. Don't grade yourself on that curve. Endure hardship. How do you do that? By keeping your head. Do the work of evangelist. Now, he's talking to a minister here, but I think it applies to all of us. Discharge all the duties of your ministry. Well, that's for people who are called to do what you're doing, Steve. Not true. You know what it says in Ephesians, my job is to do? To equip all of you for the work of the ministry. You know what ministry is? Letting your light be an example to everybody else. Didn't say stand up on a table, go stand on a street corner. I always give those people a good honk on the corner. They got the boldness to stand up there at San Jose by the Walmart that I don't have. You ever seen those folks that stand up there? Dude, just going after it. For all of sin and going before the glory of God. And I'm like, you know, just glad that was your ministry call, not mine. Because I'd be out there, hey, everybody. (laughs) 
Wasn't what I was called to do. But God has called you to something. He's called you to be the best husband or wife that anyone could ever have joined their life to. He's called you to be the most faithful, diligent, responsible, providing parent that any child has ever known. He's called you to be the most faithful steward of his word in your heart. He's called you to be the most repentant, but holy and also faithful believer there ever was. Are you with me? So we do all this by keeping our head in all situations. So as much as this verse about Paul's instruction is to Timothy during difficult times and hardship, I believe the same instruction applies to us. Keep your head in all situations. New Living Translation again says it this way, but you should keep a clear mind in every situation. You know what will muddy your mind really quick? When you do nothing but absorb everything that's going on in the world that you don't like. You talk about everything that's going on in the world that you don't like. You think about everything that's going on in the world that you won't not, don't like. Complain about everything that's going on in the world that you don't like. Your mind starts getting muddy and fuzzy. Does it not? And then all of a sudden, it feels like the world is bigger than your God. I saw this on social media this week. Yes, I have social media, everybody. And there was this preacher, I don't know where he was from, but he, he was at a stoplight, and he took a picture. His church, they created air fresheners for their car with their church's logo on them. Good for them. But what was interesting was his air freshener took up most of the picture, but there was a car just across the street from him that was like a dot. He said all of a sudden it hit him very quickly. That air freshener was not bigger than that car. But it looked bigger because it was closer to him than the car was. Y'all know where I'm going with this, don't you? He said, and if I were closer to that car, my air freshener would have been, would have been right in scale. But because that air freshener was right here, it made the car in the distance look like it was so small. That's how our God is supposed to be. Because we are close to him, everything else seems smaller. So I want to say to you this morning, if everything seems bigger than your God, it's because you're closer to everything else than you are to your God. So we got to keep a clear mind, everybody. I'm going to talk about that more in just a minute, but let me read you a few more verses. Listen to what Paul told Timothy again. I love how he instructed him. He told him what to expect, to expect in the world, but then he also said something that we need to hang on to as well. He gave him some perspective about his life, about something that he kept closer to him than everything in the world. He said this in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, I have fought the good fight. I have fought the good fight. In other words, everything I'm telling you, Timothy, I'm not telling you out of a lack of experience. I know firsthand what I'm talking about. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. In other words, there's a payoff, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Say on that day, everybody. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Here's what Paul had the ability to do in spite of what it looked like in the world around him. He always had an eternal perspective. He always had an eternal perspective. You in whatever you're doing and wherever you go, wherever you live, wherever you work, wherever you parent, wherever you do your life, you need to maintain eternal, an eternal perspective. You need to raise, raise your kids with an eternal perspective. You can't take a snapshot today of what it looks like in their lives because this isn't forever. They're going to make some unwise choices. But did you? Aren't you glad you didn't take a snapshot in that day and say, this is it. My kid's life's over. There's no more written for them. God had no further plans than this moment here. Oh, I failed. You can't do that any more than you would want anybody to do that in your own life. Am I in the right room? Always do everything that you do with an eternal perspective. The way you work should be done with an eternal perspective. Scripture says you do everything as under the Lord. In other words, you do it like if God himself is the only one who saw that you didn't cut corners that you didn't cheat, that you didn't do less than your best, then that's all that matters. It's an eternal perspective because there will be a reward one day. Paul had an eternal perspective through everything and he never lost sight of the eternal. Now, remember back up in verse two, I told you my job as a pastor, my role 
was to give careful instruction. Well, I want to give you a little bit today because I want to give you something to take home with you today. And I, and I, would, I want to challenge you. Do I believe all of you will do it? No. One of my pastor's mentors, Larry Stockstill in Louisiana, he, he's pastored ginormous churches, been someone that other ministries call when there's moral failure in the lives of people. One of the largest one that even had a church where a, a gunman came in and shot some people. He, he, he was the one called to that place for that. And here's what he said to us as pastors when 40 of us sat in front of him. He said, guys, don't ever fall victim to that thought that everybody is going to or has to do what you instruct them or God says for you to tell them to do because they're not going to do it. Can you just free yourself right there from that? And that was a very liberating day for me. So if some of you choose not to do this, guess what? You're the one that just lives without what I'm, we're talking about today. All right? Now, my faith is that all of you will do this to some degree, but don't do anything out of guilt or condemnation. Because again, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to believe and trust that if God says, hey, I should do this, there's a reason, there's a payoff. There's power in what he says to do. And I'll get to that in just a moment. But let me say this to you. My job is to equip you and to prepare you for the culture and for the times that we just read about balloons in the sky. There might be more. And you know, just to even it so the current president's not looked at negatively, they said, well, it happened under the previous president. I don't care who it happened under. I don't want a balloon going over my house. Are y'all, I don't want drones flying over saying, what's that guy doing in the backyard? I'm skimming the leaves like I do every day, four or five times a day, because we had to have a swimming pool. That's what I'm doing. Don't think anything more of it. I don't want all, all the spyware happening. I want you looking in on me. I don't like it whenever I say, hey, let's go on a cruise. The next thing you know, my Facebook's got 40 ads for cruises on there. So I went and turned the microphone off. Anybody else do what I did? Find those apps, turn your microphone off if you don't like all that. But in the midst of this world that we live in, how do we live? How does God want us to live? I think it's our response to His instruction just like Paul told Timothy, that we respond and that we are responsible to become more increasingly aware of God's presence than everything else. We're still aware of everything in the world. You still have to raise your kids, feed your kids. You still have to work, put your hand to something so that you can provide for your life. You still have to pay your rent, pay your mortgage. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You still need shoes, right? You need food. You need all this stuff that sustains life. But in the midst of all of that, what is our role? What's our responsibility as children of God? I think the first thing we have to recognize is this. We have an adversary. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His power. I like that part right there, right? That's like they'll be saying in the locker rooms the night before the Super Bowl. I doubt any coach is going to look there and go, guys, I mean, we're lucky to have made it this far. Let's just go out there and do our best, you know? Who cares the outcome? That is not going to be said in either locker room today. Not at all. We can win this, gentlemen. We're here because we earned it. We're here because we're supposed to be here. You're here because you've worked hard. You're here because you deserve to be here. Don't waste the opportunity. Keep your head in the game. Don't focus on the crowd. Don't focus on the noise. Don't focus on all the hype and the drama. It's time to get to business. Get down to business. That's how we ought to live. Don't focus on the drama. Be involved in what's going on in the world. Do your part. Be vocal. Be involved. Be engaged. But, like that air freshener in that guy's car, don't be closer to what's out in the distance than you are to the God who's right here with you. But recognize we have an adversary. Verse 11 goes on to say, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. That word literally means his sketches. Because what the enemy likes to do is get you to take a thought and, and just begin to paint a picture. And then add some words to that picture. And then add some more thought to that picture. Add some anxiety to that picture. Add some stress to that picture. Anybody ever done any of that? Got a phone call? Oh my Lord, I, know, I think I know what that's about. Oh my gosh, this is it. This is the worst. Everything that we thought was going to happen. Then you make the call and it's like nothing that you thought. But man, you painted an elaborate picture of what it was going to be though, right? This is what he's saying the enemy does. Take your stand against these schemes. 
For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. Nothing to be afraid of, everybody, but is the reality of what's going on in a realm that you cannot see. There are influences. And they only have power when you give them power in your life. God has given us clear direction then for how to respond to these schemes, these sketches, these thoughts. Ephesians 6, verse 13. Therefore, put on the full armor of God. I've taught on this before. We'll probably do it again some other day. I think the ladies just went through a study on it. The ladies' Bible study even started again this week, right? On Thursday during the day, 10 o'clock. If you're a lady here and you're not part of, you got time Thursdays at 10. They meet right here behind that door that says, not an exit. That's called the conference room, actually, right there. Thursdays at 10. You're still welcome to come. They're only one, one weekend. Yeah, y'all can come. You got another one starting at another time, right? 21st, they've got one starting on two, Tuesday night. Yeah. See Tammy or Kim. Kim, raise your hand. See Kim if you want information on those. Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. How many of you want to be able to stand firm? Stand upright. And after you've done everything to stand, meaning that you've been through some opposition, some difficult stuff, well, verse 14 says, stand firm again with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Here's what I want you to see, verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That is the only one that I want to point out to you today. I say this every week. If you've been around here for any length of time, you probably hear me say it ad nauseum. You need to know what these Scriptures say to you, for you, about you. And it's only then when you know what it says and it's in you that you have it when you need it. You know, it's really difficult to know. You, you imagine somebody from the opposing team today in, at the Super Bowl. Hey, they run out of players and all of a sudden they need to borrow one from the other team. That guy comes and stands on the other side of the ball and looks at him and goes, what are we doing? They call out a play. He's like, I have no idea what that play is. That's what a believer is like, a Christian is like, who does not know what God said. You cannot stand firm. You cannot take your stand if you don't know what God has said. And that's not to get on to you. This is just the corrective rebuking part to encourage you to understand what it says. It is the sword, the only offensive piece of the armor that there is. You take the sword of the Spirit. You use it when culture is losing its mind, when Sketches and thoughts are being built in your heart, your soul, your head. When trauma that you've experienced is trying to overwhelm your emotions, you take the sword of the Spirit and you say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is He that is in me than he that's in the world. He keeps me in perfect peace when my mind is fixed on Him. Are, are you with me? The Spirit of God has been given to me, the Spirit of truth so that I can know and understand who I am in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things have become new. The old is gone. Yeah, but so-and-so keeps saying, so. yeah, yeah, well, that was the old guy. He's a foreigner to me. I don't know him. Remember a couple weeks ago I talked about some of us are dragging around a dead corpse, just letting that thing pull on us and weigh us down like crazy, rather than cutting the cord and realizing that you have been made new in Christ now, you live in a body, you live in flesh that has a temperament, has a disposition. Anybody know what I'm talking about? It has certain inhibitions, it's certain likes, certain attractions, certain temptations. We all have that flesh. Paul talked about it. Romans 6, 7, 8, all in that area right there. He said, listen, the flesh has desires that I know I should not do, and sometimes I do them even though I know I shouldn't do them. And even though my heart and my head and my spirit knows what I should do, sometimes I don't do that thing I should do. Oh my gosh, what kind of wretched man, what kind of tormented person I am. Then he says, what is it, Romans 8 verse 1? There is down there now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. 
One of the tactics the enemy wants to use against you is to tell you you're the only one that struggles. You're the only one that has temptation. You're the only one that ever allows the old man to pop his head up. And you hear him talking and go, "Woo, that was rough. No, you're not the only one. As long as you live in this body, there will be that tension. There will be that struggle. But guess what? God has told you to put on the full armor. To take up the sword of the Spirit. And speak and say what it says in those moments. Because that's when you can stand firm. So here's what our responsibility is. Here's one thing I wanted to give you today. I want us to look at one psalm, Psalm 91. Psalm 91 was, most Jewish scholars believe, composed by Moses. Most of you know Moses' story. God chose him to lead the children of Israel out of 400 years of slavery. Can you imagine taking people that had been in something for four days into something new? Or four months or four years to something new. How many of you know what it's like dealing with people when there's new stuff or change? Especially Christians. A lot of Christians hate change. They've got these weird lights they use and there's smoke in the building. I mean, I remember when that was a new thing and everybody was like, oh my God, it's the devil. Like, well, change. Folks don't like change, do they? Moses had to wrestle with God. And they went back and forth. Some days God said, I agree with you, Moses. They're not worth it. I'm going to smite them all. And he, Moses would go, no, 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 God, don't do that. I, I, I think they can be led. And then there were days that Moses was God, God, what have you called me to? Kill them all. I mean, this was the tension and the anxiety. So this Psalm, Psalm 91, was written, it's believed, during the 40 years that they wandered in the wilderness. 40 years. That after God had instructed him, as to how to erect this physical tabernacle. When he entered that thing, it's believed that all that is there in Psalm 91 is the result of that time. And I thought it was interesting this morning. I've told you all the time, it's like when I shower, I go to another place. Sometimes I even have to go, did I wash my hair? Anybody else ever do that? I got a routine. I go top down just because there are times I'm thinking, I'm thinking, and I have literally gotten out before and looked at my head and thought, that's nasty. I forgot to wash my hair. Anybody ever done that? You think, oh, man, Let's see if we can get away with this today. And then the other times you got to go lean back in there, and it's like, oh, whatever, you're full in the shower. So frustrating. Because for me, I just go into thoughts in this morning in the shower. It just kind of hit me. Everything we're about to read very quickly in Psalm 91 about the, the presence and the shelter and the protection of God came to a man when God took material things, put them together, and he walked in what was made with man's hands and got a revelation of what it truly represented that was supernatural. Moses walked into a physical structure but was overwhelmed with the spiritual magnificence and awe and the presence of a God he could not see. So I think the significance for us is though we're walking in a world that is physical, that is tangible, we touch things, we experience things, we can, just like Moses walking into that tabernacle, experience the same divine presence of God that Moses did every single day. Let's look at this. Psalm 91 verse 1. He who dwells, it literally means remains in the shelter of the Most High, will rest in the shadow or the covering presence of the Almighty. Listen to that. He who dwells or remains in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow or the covering presence of the Almighty. Just imagine Moses walking into the structure. It's been completed. He's walked through the various places within it and he gets to the most holy place. To meet with God and all of a sudden it overwhelms him. When I am in here, I am covered and I'm protected. I'm sheltered from everything on the outside by God's presence. Each and every single one of us has got to personally acknowledge this. Which is why it's important that you know what God's word says. In a world where you're facing so many difficult things and challenging things and it can just be overwhelming. Remember, the, 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 the proximity of the presence of what you're looking at has power over everything else. 
If it's closer, it's bigger. If it's thought about most, it will be greater. He says, he who literally remains in the shelter of the Most High, they will rest in the shadow, the covering presence of the Almighty. But you've got to acknowledge it. So here's what Moses demonstrates to us. He says this in verse 2, I will say of the Lord, in light of this revelation, this understanding, this awareness, I'm going to say of the Lord, he is my refuge. He's my fortress. He's my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save me from the fowler. It's a metaphor for Satan. From the fowler's snare or, for some, from, or from Satan's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover me with his feathers. It's literally a metaphor for an eagle. When an eagle has eaglets, the way that they, the, the eagle protects those young, the small, they literally stretch out their, their wings and put them over them. Bring safety and security, comfort. There's an awareness that there's something greater between them and the world. And God is saying this, Moses is acknowledging this, that for those who remain and dwell in the presence of God, those who are aware of his presence, he will cover you with his wings and you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. In other words, it will be your protection from violence. The message translation says, his protection will, his arms, they fend off all harm. Can you just see that? I watched a, another reel on social media this week. It was this little monkey eating something. It had a little baby monkey. And a guy who was doing the filming was holding out some food. And the little baby monkey kept running away to get the food from the person. The mama kept reaching out and yanking the baby back like this. And when he'd reach out, pow, he'd pull the baby back again. That's what your God will do for you if you remain in his presence. He will pull you back in. He'll protect you. He'll cover you. His faithfulness is yours. It's been promised to shelter you. Verse 5 says, you will not fear the terror of night. You will not fear the terror of night. For Moses, it's the wilderness. There are adversaries out here. There's harm out here. There are unseen things out here. Forty years we do this. Every single day, every night, somebody's got to watch. Somebody's got to protect. He knew what he was talking about, but he said, listen, we're not going to fear nor will we fear the arrow that flies by day, the adversaries or the people that might come against us. We're not going to be afraid. We're not going to cower. We're not going to be looking over our shoulder constantly for what might happen. Verse 6, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, the things you can't see, nor the plague that destroys at midday. Listen to what he says in verse 7. And this is a verse y'all have heard me say to a thousand times if I've said it once. I prayed this verse over my children every day they went to school. Every day they were in college in states away from me. I prayed this verse over my children. A thousand may fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Some of you might think, Phew, that's pretty bold. I mean, unexplainable things happen. Yes, the acknowledgement is there. But would you not rather be engaged? in speaking and saying something from the sword that God has given to you over your life, your family, your home? God, though a thousand may fall at one side and ten thousand at another, no harm will come near me. Verse 8, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. Man, this is crazy. So how do you get to this place of security and safety? You look at verse 9. If you make the Most High your dwelling, if you Make the most high. See why you've got to take this? You've got to do it. Listen, I pray this over you guys all the time. May not call all of you by name, but I say, Father, for everybody that calls family, their church, their family, I pray this over them today. But you've got to make this your prayer. If you make the Lord most high, you're dwelling. In other words, you live there continually. You sit down there. You say, God, I'm putting you... I'm getting closer to you than I am the things of this world. I'm going to see you more closely than everything else in this world. Even the Lord who is my refuge, verse 10 goes on to say, then no harm will befall or overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. I like how the message translation says, it can't get through the door. How about that? If you make God close, 
If you draw close, James 4 says, God will draw close to you. If you do that, guess what? It can't get through the door. But it's on our phones. Well, that's an issue between you and your family. And here's what I love. Now we're getting into the unseen realm about angelic protection. Look at verse 11. For he, God, all of this was Moses' declaration. Now it's God speaking. Moses said, God, I will, I will make you close. I will live and remain closer to you than anything else. God responds. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Are there angels? Yes, there are. I can prove it to you scripturally. Yes, there are. There is unseen assistance for you. Verse 12, they angels will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread upon the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Now listen to God responding again. Because he, because you love me, says the Lord, I will rescue you. I will protect you for you acknowledge my name. I know you saw me change the words in there because I made it personal. Because you love me, says the Lord, I will rescue you. I will protect you for you acknowledge my name. That's part of that remaining. That's part of that dwelling close to God. Verse 15, you will call on me and I will answer you. I will be with you in trouble. I will deliver and honor you. With long life, I will satisfy you and show you my salvation. I prayed that over my kids every single day. I still pray it over them. God, be with them. Even in trouble, deliver them. David, how many months ago was it that you and Corinne got in that car accident? Two years? Good gravy. Two years ago, David and his wife, Corinne, raise your hand right over there. She's still walking through some medical things, and they're still dealing with some court stuff. Turned across Old St. Augustine Road, and some lady completely T-boned their car. If you saw the car, it totaled the car. To make matters even more sensitive, my parents happened to be driving by right after that happened, and they said, oh my gosh, that, I think they noticed David standing there on the side of the road and saw that car and just immediately were shocked. What the enemy could have done in that moment I'd got to believe, and I'm not telling them to thank me because it's just my role and my responsibility as a parent, even though he's married. I pray this over them all the time. God, be with them in trouble. Though a thousand fall at one side and 10,000 in another, no harm will come near them. Now, they're walking some stuff out physically, but they're still here. They're still ministering to your teenagers and the teenagers in this neighborhood, still doing it. The enemy would have loved to have taken that opportunity away for some of the teenagers in this area to be ministered to. But we've made this personal. You need to make it personal. God, you will be with them in trouble. You will deliver them, and with long life, you will satisfy them. Listen, I pray this over you. I pray it over myself, my wife, my family. And when I do this, here's what I'm doing. And if you'll do this, here's what you're doing. You're acknowledging God's presence all throughout the day. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Though a thousand may fall at one side, 10,000 and another. No harm will come near David, Corinne, Kristen, Megan, Alexa, Tammy, myself, Family Life Church, everybody that calls that home, Brett, Michael, Terry Eskew, the Wigners, Wigners, <laughs> Spitzers. We were just with them not too long ago in the hospital with their little baby. She's doing just fine, right? Don't you know I was praying that prayer when we were driving down to meet them and their baby who got taken down there in an ambulance. God, you'll be with them in trouble. With long life, will you satisfy that little girl? A little girl that's going to completely up in and change Austin's life after three boys. You're acknowledging God's presence when you do this. That's how you're drawing near. That's how you take comfort and security knowing that those unseen promised forces of angels, angelic protection are at work all around you. You take this psalm and you speak it over your life and your family. That is my assignment from the Spirit of God today for you. Take this psalm Speak it over your life and your family every single day. Whether you do it in the morning, you do it in the afternoon, you do it at night, I don't care when you do it, just do it. Read it in a personal way. Personalize it. Put your name in there. And as you do that and speak it over your life and family, it will not matter what's going on in culture around you. You'll be able to keep your head. You'll have a clear mind each and every single day. Are you with me? 
Go ahead and stand to your feet this morning because I want to pray over you before we head out today. But for everybody watching online this morning, I pray that today's message helps you. It helps you to understand and realize that your God, He loves you with an unending love. And He's promised you so much for life. I pray today that you would take that psalm and you would pray it over your life every single day. I call you blessed now in Jesus' name. Place the name of Jesus on you. And until we're together again next time, thanks for being with us today and you have an incredible week.